Alistair, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Alistair McGregor. I'm the Member of Parliament for Couch and Malahad Langford. And I'd like to first start off by acknowledging that uh, we're gathered here today in the traditional and unceded territories of Couch and people uh, who I'm very fortunate to have a, an amazing relationship with. And before I introduce our special guest and give him a very warm couch and welcome, I just wanted to say a few words about the subject uh, that will be top of mind for us today. When I first got into elected politics, I was primarily motivated uh, with helping people. And indeed, before I became an elected official, I worked as a caseworker. And many of the issues that I was dealing with with families across the table really did center around housing. I've had too many conversations with people who had to make those difficult choices each and every month between finding the money for rent, utilities, and putting good quality food on the table. And sadly, that situation has persisted even during the last six years that I've been fortunate enough to be the member of parliament for this area. Housing is one of those key issues that really is a nucleus around which everything else depends. If you don't have access to safe, secure, and affordable housing, really it affects everything else. It affects uh, a person's security in life, their ability to really go out and seek job. And it also has wider ramifications for our community because I'm hearing time and time again from small businesses all throughout the riding that they are experiencing a labor shortage. They cannot find the workers to keep their operations going. Those workers are suffering with an affordability crisis because we have all seen the housing uh, prices here on Vancouver Island have just gone absolutely white hot. They are stratospheric right now. And indeed, many people, I hear stories all around the riding of people getting sometimes more than $100,000 of their asking price. So there is a very real crunch, and the problem is all along the continuum. So it's a big issue. It affects people not only who are housing insecure, but also those people who are trying to get into the market for the first time. And despite some of the efforts that we've seen at increasing the supply, the affordability is, is such a huge factor because people have not seen their wages rise to measure it with the housing price increase. So uh, that's why it's a huge issue for me. It's why it will continue to be a big issue for me. And I think that the people of Couch and Mallet Langford need someone who's going to continue making sure that this issue is, is a big one, not only for our riding, but for our province and indeed for our country. And with that, uh, it's, it's indeed my great pleasure to formally introduce NDP leader Jagmi Singh, uh, who has spoken uh, far and wide on this topic and continues to be showing great leadership uh, on this from coast to coast to coast. So, with that, Jagmeet, welcome to the Couch Valley, and thanks for being here today. Thanks so much, Alistair. Uh, I want to thank Alistair for the great work he does in the riding, fighting for, for people. And this, this particular problem is, is a huge problem. We know that housing is a crisis, and it has been a crisis before the pandemic, and it has only gotten worse during the pandemic. We know that there are so many people that cannot find a place to call home, whether it is rent or to own a home. And I've spoken with so many people and they tell me heartbreaking stories about how they want to stay in their community. They want to stay in the communities where they've got friends and family and connections and their work, but they simply can't afford it. I remember speaking with the family when I knocked on their door and I was asking them, what is their biggest worry? And they told me housing and they lived in a home. So I, I was wondering what they meant. They said, well, our, our daughter is a professional. She's working hard, but she cannot afford to find a place to call home. And they asked her to come up and she was living in the basement. And I talked to her. She was a teacher working for six years, had a great job, but was considering leaving her community because she couldn't afford to stay. And that should not be the way things are. So we are committed to making sure we fix this problem. Reality is under six years of Justin Trudeau being in government, things have gotten worse. We've seen the rate of increase of housing prices increase the highest in all developed nations here in Canada. That means the worst track record of housing prices increasing has happened under the six years of Justin Trudeau being in government. That is wrong. We are committed to solutions. And some of the solutions are tackling the pressures that are driving up the cost of housing. So stopping the speculation where Canadians are having to compete with foreign investors to buy a home. We need a foreign investment tax federally. We also know that house flipping is driving up the cost of housing. We've got to stop that as well. We've got to stop those pressures that are driving up the cost of housing. And we also have to build more homes that people can afford, homes that are in people's budgets, whether it's to rent or to own, we need more homes. And that's why we're committed to building half a million or 500,000 
new homes that people can afford. Uh, this will make a big difference here in Couch and Valley, on the island, and across Canada. It'll create jobs, it'll be a job stimulus, but also build homes that people can actually afford. We need to get serious about this. In the past, we have. After the World Wars, Canada made a decision to build homes, and we built hundreds and thousands of homes that people could actually afford. We need to do that again. That's our commitment to you. And I want to thank you all for, for being here today and I'm ready for the questions you might have. Back to you, Nina. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup very much. Very much. Uh, uh, if, 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 I members, I I members if, if you have a question, question if you use the raise hand, raise raise hand function, function on Zoom. On Zoom. We'll take three take questions, questions virtually, virtually, and then we will go. Then we'll go, we'll go. Uh, alors, je vais vous inviter à utiliser la fonction « Levez la main » et poser vos questions. Uh, et nous allons commencer. We will start with Mike Gray with the CTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Singh. Um, today, you're in BC launching a little tour. Uh, the Prime Minister is also in BC, and he has one of your strongest political allies, John Horgan, at his announcement today. Uh, and he's been quite complimentary of the Prime Minister and the work he's been able to do. Are you disappointed Premier Horgan's not with you today in BC instead uh, supporting the Prime Minister? No, not at all. Uh, and I'm also not surprised that Justin Trudeau chose to make an announcement around childcare here in BC. The NDP government, like NDP governments across Canada, have been the ones that have done the heavy lifting to actually bring in affordable childcare. They're the ones that have led the charge. Where Liberals have been promising childcare for decades, new Democrats have been delivering. And it's a great contrast to show a Premier who's actually getting the job done with the prime minister who's all show. And I want to point out something. If this prime minister, if Justin Trudeau is serious about childcare, well, we have a test coming up in a couple of months. If the prime minister is serious about getting childcare done, we want to make that happen. We are absolutely yeah, supportive of making sure we've got universal accessible childcare. In fact, we want to make that happen. We want to call Trudeau's bluff. If he wants to make this happen, let's get it done. We've got two years on our mandate. Let's make this happen. But if Justin Trudeau calls an election in the next couple of months, then we know it was all for show. We know that it wasn't something that he meant to do. He just wanted to do a flashy press conference, but it wasn't interested in actually delivering the childcare that people need. So the test is going to be in the next couple of months. Was this all for show? Or is he serious about getting things done? If he is, we are here and we are ready to deliver the childcare that Canadians need. Mike, you want to go ahead with your follow-up? Yeah, thanks, Nina. Uh, just respectfully, Mr. Singh, I, I don't know how you can call this show. He's signed a deal with the BC government, and one of your strongest allies, Premier Horgan, was the first premier to sign on to it. So how can you call the prime minister out for saying that he's all show on child care when he's just signed a deal with one of your strongest political allies to get a what would likely be a major campaign promise checked off for him? Well, well, the answer to that is, if he calls an election in the next couple of months, how is there going to be follow through on this? He is jeopardizing that entire plan. Uh, if he calls an election in the next couple of months, this is for show. Like all the bills that he introduced right at the last moment, right at the end of session, knowing that he was planning an election. And I want to highlight this. If the prime minister actually wants to follow through and develop the program and make sure there's legislation and make sure there's funding, we need to continue to work in Ottawa to make that happen. And I want that to happen. I would love for this to actually be serious and a real commitment. But again, if the government goes to an election, then it undermines that promise because it's not going to be able to continue while we're in an election. Work won't continue. If the outcome is not, not something that continues the same work, then he's jeopardized that work. So again, I make my claim very clearly. If the prime minister calls an election, then this announcement is all for sure. We've seen the prime minister sign deals and make announcements in the past. And when an election is called, they're canceled then the work does not continue. So again, I want to be very clear. I want this to happen. I think this is incredibly exciting. And I am proud that, that uh, John Horgan, as the BC Premier, has been leading the charge on affordable childcare. It has made a difference in so many people's lives. Every day I meet someone who has been impacted by the new uh, pilot project here in BC, how it's made a difference, a life-changing difference in their lives. But if Justin Trudeau goes to an election, then he does not mean this. That is not a serious commitment. It means that he's looking for power, He's not interested in getting the work done. I'm interested in making sure we actually deliver childcare. So if that's the case and Justin Trudeau wants to do it, let's continue working. Let's go back to Parliament in September. Let's pass legislation, sign more deals across the country, and get this to happen. 
Next question, Chris Reynolds with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Mr. Singh. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, I'm wondering if this isn't for show, if hypothetically an election is not called, to what extent should this promise, this agreement be delivered on? To what extent does it represent a very positive step forward? That is, do you, do you support the, uh, this so-called $10 per day childcare in theory, if it actually gets done, or is that even that insufficient? The Democrats have been championing universal child care for, for years and years. We believe in this. We've ran our campaigns on this. So we are excited about making sure this happens. I would love to see this. I know the difference it can make. And when we look at the pandemic and how the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women, women were amongst the hardest hit. They are the ones that lost their jobs and now can't find child care to go back to work. We've seen a loss in some of the gains that were made to the point that Women's participation in the job market is the lowest in decades, the lowest since the 90s. So we need to invest in childcare, and I want to see that happen. And I'm excited to see that happen. And if Justin Trudeau is serious about this, I can count on my support to make sure we move forward in delivering more childcare to more Canadians across this country. But if he doesn't, and if he goes to an election, again, this is another example of Justin Trudeau being all for show. Just like he ran a campaign in 2019 on universal pharmacare, talked about it in the throne speech, made a commitment, and then we brought forward legislation based on his own commissioned report that he voted against. We brought forward legislation that was in completely in line with what his own government commissioned a report and found that that was the step forward and he voted against that, really saying it was all for show. He wanted to do pharmacare in the election as a campaign announcement. He wanted to do it in the throne speech, again, as a show. But then when it came down to actually taking a step, he chose a side of big pharmaceuticals and hurt Canadians. I don't want that to be the case this time. And that's why I'm very aggressive in calling out this bluff. I don't want this to happen. I think this is a great opportunity. Let's actually deliver the help that people need instead of just an announcement and just doing it for show. Let's continue to work. Let's not go to an election. And let's do the work in September to make this a reality, not just in BC, but across Canada. Um. Earlier today, uh, Nunavut MP Mumalat Kakak and Ontario MP Charlie Angus called for a special investigation or a special prosecutor to conduct an independent investigation into the harm done by residential schools and other institutions, including sanatoriums or sanitariums. Uh, I'll have to look that one up, but I'm wondering to what extent is this necessary uh, even after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? I think this is a powerful step forward in, in addition to the Truth and Reconciliation calls to action. This is accountability. There are people that are responsible for institutions that resulted in the killing of Indigenous children. And we are still reeling from the discovery of unmarked graves. And I was talking to a friend, just kind of reflecting on what this means. For people that went to school in an elementary school here in the Couch and Valley or an elementary school anywhere in, in BC or in Ontario or in Quebec, there are no grave sites at schools. And it is not a coincidence that there are grave sites at these residential institutions. They were designed to kill kids. They were not designed to raise them or to teach them. They were designed to strip them of their identity, their language, their culture and their lives. And that's something that, that demands additional steps of accountability and appointing a public, a special prosecutor to, to have that accountability is a powerful step forward. But again, I would also add to that, we need to see this liberal government implement all the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They promised, Justin Trudeau clearly promised to implement all of them six years ago and has only done a fraction of them. So there's a lot that we need to do but this additional step is something I think very powerful and would walk the path of reconciliation with real accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Mary Brooke with Island Social Trends. Please go ahead. Hi, Jagmeet. Um, welcome back to BC on the island. Um, so I'm looking at your housing uh, supply suggestion, and as you know, that's a municipal, provincial, and federal mix in getting housing going. 
and the costs of supplies for houses have gone up recently because of um, COVID and the wildfires, lumber costs more. I'm just looking, will, what will be your direction for a solution? Will it be, will you be presenting a bill in the fall in, or when it comes time in the House of Commons? And will you work with FCM to also get um, their backing? Thanks Mary for the question and, and great to hear your voice. Uh, absolutely, we think this is something we need to be a partner with all levels of government. But what we've seen over the past number of years is that there has not been federal partnership. Since uh, the 90s, we've, that's the last time we saw real investment in CMHC in terms of building homes. And since then, we've not really seen any new cooperative housing or not-for-profit housing or federally funded projects. So there's been a big uh, gap in terms of the investments at the federal level. Uh, we've seen municipalities step up and try to be innovative. We've seen provinces like BC do their best to try to increase more uh, opportunities for housing, but we've not seen that same commitment at the federal level. And so that's why what we're calling for is a really bold investment, a two-pronged approach. One, really tackling the speculation with taxes on foreign investment uh, on housing. So similar to what BC has done provincially, we want to put that in place federally. So People don't just jump jurisdictions. We want that across the country. We also want to tackle right now the incentives that people have to, to do property flipping. It is right now incentivized by our tax system for someone to buy a home, to fix it up, and to flip it for a lot more. And it's driving up the cost of housing. We don't want housing to be a commodity. We want it to be a place for people to call home. And we can do that if we put in the right policy. So on one is tackling the speculation and the forces that are driving up the cost of housing. And on the second, on the other hand, we need to really invest massively into projects with the pro with provinces, with municipalities, listening to FCM, who laid out a really strong course of what needs to be done in terms of building more housing. But we need to see that federal leadership, and it's really not been there. We need to see bold and massive investments in building more homes that people can actually afford. Thank you very much. Now we will go to in-person questions. Uh, Andrea, if you can help me just identify if someone has a question in person to uh, please identify themselves and their media and ask their question. Just going to do a last checkup to see if there will be if there are any questions in person. Okay, so we will go back to Zoom. I just wanna check, is there any other questions? If you have a question online to please use the raise hand function to ask your question and follow up. Si vous avez une question, veuillez s'il vous plaît utiliser la fonction lever la main pour poser votre question et question de suivi. So we will go ahead with Mary Brooke once more. Please go ahead. Hi, Jagmeet. So um, also on housing and with this heat dome and heat wave that we've had recently, I'm just wondering if there could be some federal standards put in place for cooling and ventilation in homes, because that has proven to be a deadly situation in BC anyway, with the recent heat dome. What would you, what would your NDP party do in that direction? Yes, uh, certainly. I think, I think you've, you've outlined a, another opportunity. When we build those affordable homes, those homes that people can actually afford, that, that homes that are in their budgets, we need to make sure that they are um, low emissions, that these are homes that are leaving a, a low carbon footprint, but also homes that are designed for the realities that we're up against. We know that FCM has said that they need funds, cities need funds to be able to put in place proactive solutions to the impacts of climate, the climate crisis. So putting in place things that will help protect cities and communities and municipalities. Similarly, when we build homes, we need to build them so that they are equipped to deal with the potential increase in temperature, that they are equipped to deal with the realities of what, what those communities need. And uh, potentially with increasing temperatures and increasing heat waves, the reality of those heat waves have to be incorporated into the plans when we build these, these homes that should be sustainable and should be low carbon footprint and help reduce our emissions, but also be homes that can actually function for people in all communities. Mary, did you have a follow-up? Um, well, that was my follow-up from the previous session, but um, 
uh, on the back to childcare, uh, what do you think the the stumbling block is with that with the Liberals? Like, why has it taken so long? Um, I mean, that's a big question, but uh, what directions can nudge it forward now? It has taken a long time. This has been a promise that Liberals have made for decades. They've, they've made it uh, for over 20 years and, and they've not followed through on it. And now they're making it again, another big commitment on the eve of a potential election. Instead of making it clear that they're committing to get this done and use the two years we have left, they're making this announcement in the summer when we know all signs are pointing to an August election, which does not have to happen. So if they're serious about this, I again want to say they need to follow through with this commitment and actually make it happen. It can't just be a flashy announcement to win an election. These are people. These are families. These are women that want to be able to go back to work. They cannot work right now because they can't find a place for their kids to be cared for. Childcare is vital. We need it as a part of the recovery. And I am committed to make sure this actually happens. I'm calling the bluff here. I want to see Justin Trudeau deliver on this. And I'd be happy to work together to actually see childcare implemented across our country. We will go back in person. I believe CPAC has a question. Uh, yeah, very, very quick question. The, uh, it, uh, it does appear that we're headed for a uh, What do you think the ballot question will be? How do you think they can do this, uh, particularly here in the island, particularly in BC, that the uh, New Democrats are the way to go? What we appreciate the question. Uh, I think what we want to show Canadians is that in this in this pandemic, when people were down and out, when things were really tough, when people were losing their jobs, when there was lockdowns, who was there for you and who fought for you? We've got a track record to run on right now where we can show the Liberals didn't want to bring in additional help beyond expanding EI. We fought to bring in CERB. When they brought in CERB, they brought it in at $1,000. We fought hard, tooth and nail, to double that to $2,000. At $2,000, it meant that people were able to stay in their homes, able to keep paying the bills, put food on the table. We made that happen. The Liberals had no support plan for students that, that were in university that couldn't find a summer job. We fought and brought in the Canadian Emergency Student Benefit. We made that happen. When it came to people that were getting sick, we fought and brought in paid sick leave. And uh, Premier Horgan was a big part in, in supporting our call for this. But we made that happen. That was a new Democrat initiative to give people the ability to stay at home when they're sick. And the wage subsidy, the Liberals started at 10%. At 10%, covering 10% of a worker's salary was not enough to keep people employed. We fought tooth and nail to bring that up to 75%, saving millions of jobs. So when you look at the, this pandemic and all the help that people received, it would not have happened but for New Democrats being there. You've got a New Democrat elected in your riding, in your community. You've got someone who's going to fight for you. So what's in it for people is that when you have New Democrats, you've got allies. They're going to fight for you in Ottawa. Conservatives can't point to a single victory. Despite being the official opposition, they've got not a single thing they can point to that they fought for or pushed for to make people's lives better. It was New Democrats that drove all the positive changes that improved access to help for people. And that's what I'll put to Canadians. If you want someone that's going to fight for you, elect a new Democrat. If it's here in the Couchin Valley, I'd encourage you to vote again for Alistair McGregor. And across Canada, vote for new Democrats who are going to fight for you to give you and your families the help you need. Uh, is there a follow-up question? Uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould laid out a, a lot of the similar points at Mumala Kakak, who's a New Democrat member of parliament, that the House of Commons is not a place welcoming, particularly to Indigenous people. And, and that is something we've got to change. And the reality is when the House of Commons as an institution has been responsible for a lot of the decisions that have harmed Indigenous people, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that place is welcoming to Indigenous voices and Indigenous people. And so I think it is a big loss. Jody Wilson-Raybould has been a powerful voice in politics. She's been a fearless voice, and I want to acknowledge that. I know she will continue to be a powerful voice in this country, and uh, it is a loss, though, for, for everyone, the fact that she won't be running again. 
I would like to see if there's any more questions in person. That's good. That's good. I'll jump in, but I got muted there. I would say New Democrat, absolutely. <laughs> Good, yeah. We're good, Nina. You're good too. All right. I'm just gonna do a one last check online to see if there's any more questions. I see no more questions. So this concludes our press conference. Ceci met fin à notre conférence de presse. Thank you. Merci.